They studied 900,000 people and said that low carb means early death. Is that what the numbers really say or is this just another scare tactic? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. In this study, which is kind of a review of lots of different studies, we're going to hear about a common problem, a common flaw with these articles and be sure to listen to the end where you hear my final thoughts. This is a frustrating video to make, but I've been meaning to make it for quite some time. So I'm plowing forward. In the end, I'm going to infect you with that same frustration. Now, Dr. Nick is a good source of information for reviewing articles. It doesn't have the clinical background or, or clinical experience that I, I would want, but a good reviewer of articles. I've reviewed some of his videos before. So I analyzed five studies, uh, some of them individual studies and one meta-analysis trying to find out if across hundreds of thousands of participants in these studies, there is an increased risk of dying on a low carbohydrate diet compared to generally a high carbohydrate diet. Now, there's plenty of definitions for what low carb and high carb are, and we'll get into what that means, but. So our paper in 2007, I believe a while back, actually made some definitions of what low carb means. And others have made definitions of low carb diets before. You know, the traditional American diet, the standard American diet has hundreds of grams of carbohydrates per day. Typically 30 to 40% of the diet is carbohydrate. And now how do you know low is low, low compared to what? So a low carbohydrate diet could be 200 grams or 100 grams of carbohydrates per day, but that's not going to give you low carbohydrate to get ketosis or weight loss. And so most experts in this field say that a low carbohydrate diet starts at about what, 150, 120 grams of carbohydrate per day, and then going down to a keto level, which would be 50 grams or 20 grams of carbs per day, and that's total carbs, not net. So that's what we're trying to look for in any study that uses that definition of low carbohydrate. Let me give you a brief overview of the results of these analyses. These analyses re indicate reduced risk of premature death when people consume a low carbohydrate diet, and these indicate there is raised risk of premature death, like we see here, where we're looking at death rates over time. The higher the lines go, the more death, and each line corresponds to a certain amount of carbohydrate consumption. The purple line there, the Q4, is the lowest carbohydrate condition. Of course, looking at a graph like this, you would want to examine the fine print to see what are the percentage changes there and what kind of difference there. Is it clinically relevant or statistically relevant, but not clinically relevant? It's hard for me to tell in that case. How do we square all that mixed information? Why don't studies agree? Before someone screams, funding! I provide all the funding and conflicts of interest information attached to this video. Many of the studies were publicly funded with no conflicts of interest. But there's still plenty of good explanation for why these studies disagree and how we can apply this information regardless. For one, a low carbohydrate diet can be healthy or unhealthy, which one analysis delved into. Essentially, they broke up 37,000 people's data into two buckets, healthy or unhealthy. We'll get into what that means momentarily. When looking at people that were on a lower carbohydrate diet, yet the diet was made up of unhealthy ingredients, there was a consistent increase in mortality risk. However, when the low carbohydrate diet was made up of healthy ingredients, the reverse happened. People had reduced risk. So this could be an easy defining feature because if studies don't make that distinction, it could mean that the data is skewed toward harm or no risk reduction. That being the case, what qualified for each bucket as healthy or unhealthy? The unhealthy was qualified as high in saturated fat, animal protein, and a lack of healthy carbohydrates like fiber and nutrient-dense foods, like fruits and non-starchy vegetables. Right, and so there's a problem calling these unhealthy by those standards. 
The other flaw that comes to mind or limitation is that these are all cohort studies. These are observational studies. And if you're watching my channel from before or from now going on forward, we say that correlation does not prove causation, even if there was some kind of correlation here. So the definition of unhealthy being high saturated fat is not how I define it anymore. So now we're getting into the the nuance of categorization, which we don't believe reflects the reality of the foods. There is one study that I think is better in a few different ways and gives us far clearer answers, and that's this one. This one actually echoes what the others mostly say, but it addresses some methodological issues that I won't bore you with unless you're a physionic insider. In that analysis, the researchers compared more vegetable-heavy versus animal-based food-heavy low-carbohydrate diets and showed the same result that less animal-based proteins and fat consumption but more vegetable consumption related to greater protection from mortality. But here's the kicker. In none of their group study did people eat no animal protein and fat. So there was a protective relationship of consuming some while prioritizing vegetable consumption. The bottom line is that in most of these studies, eating a small or to even a moderate amount of animal protein and fats on a lower carbohydrate diet was related to reduced mortality risk if accompanied by an emphasis on vegetables and other plant-based sources as well. I'll dive deeper into the details in just a minute. Even the study he's pointing out there, the good one, it's still an observational study. Nutritional epidemiology has its limitations and then categorization of what's healthy and unhealthy there's going to be a bias toward thinking plant-based is healthy from these researchers. That's just the way they believe in things. You know how we've been going on about low-carbohydrate studies? I mean, you see the titles, right? The thing is, none of these analyses are in low-carbohydrate diets like you're probably thinking of them. For example, this analysis, the lowest carbohydrate group is 46% of their nutrition was carbohydrates. Some analyses went lower than that, but none get close to what most people in the low-carb community would consider low-carbohydrate. In fact, even in this study that used the word ketogenic diet, the most suitable low-carbohydrate diet seems to have included as much as 100 grams of carbohydrates by my admittedly rough calculations. So that would be pretty high for, uh, it would be low-carbohydrate, but not keto level. Keto meaning your carbohydrates are low enough so that your body turns some of the fat into ketones to fuel the, the cells that need ketones or glucose. So a keto diet is really a fat burning diet that's achieved by either low, very low calorie or very low carbohydrate intake. And that I would say is a major flaw. The first flaw being that these are observational, not experimental types of research design. Now, I don't know about you, but that ain't no ketogenic diet on any planet that I've inhabited, and I've inhabited many. To be honest, either the messaging needs to change, like this study title, which uses the word lower rather than low, which is a relative term and correct, or the researchers just need to get a lot more granular with their data. Well, I thought the, and when I published papers, I tried to give the percent of carbs, fats, and proteins of the dietary pattern in the abstract so that you wouldn't have to actually read the whole article. And certainly to put the name in the title, is very difficult because do you mean it's low carb but high protein or high fat or you know what kind of low carb diet are you doing is it keto level in our papers we wrote low carbohydrate ketogenic diet to describe the less than 20 total grams of carbs per day not net total grams per day low carb keto is what we called it that, of course, assumes that we have long-term data and people consuming less than 20 or 10 or 5% of their nutrition from carbohydrates. I really don't know. Yeah, and so I'm reminded of the idea of looking backwards for information by a trip we took out to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina with the, the scouts years ago. And, you know, the idea that should humans fly and have powered flight, the Orville and Wilbur Wright could have done a meta-analysis of whether humans should 
fly and have powered airplane flight, they would have concluded, no, humans shouldn't fly. And so they actually figured out a way by looking at the birds to come up with an airplane with the wings that moved a little bit to have the first powered human flight in North Carolina. So had they done a meta-analysis looking backwards in time, they would have concluded, why even try? We need experimental science going forward in time, or at least observational studies now of people with documentation of being on a keto diet that's happening in several kinds of studies now, where we see the effect of someone on a low-carb keto diet going forward, ideally with randomization to several different types of diets. That would be wonderful. But so the idea that we could do better than before apparently doesn't fall into line with the necessarily retrospective or even prospective uncontrolled researchers who look at nutritional epidemiology. I'm an experimentalist, a clinical trialist. I think we can come up with even something better and maybe even have power human fly. Oh, right. That already happened. So I, I like this critique here in general, the idea that it's nutritional epidemiology is not focused on enough. Here's the bottom line. One, while these studies don't look at low carbohydrate diets like most people use them, they still give us valuable information on the trend. As in, if you reduce your carbohydrate consumption, how should you go about doing that? Number two, even if point one is true, we can't say any of this definitively applies to people on a true ketogenic diet because these individuals tend to have a, a different physiological state that deserves its own study. Yeah, I, I'm, I wouldn't be so polite as he is that, no, these studies don't apply. It's like apples and oranges. They're not studying keto people, not even keto-ish or keto-like, and so they don't apply. Number three, those two points stated a lower carbohydrate diet can either raise mortality risk or reduce it. It depends on the quality of that lower carbohydrate diet. So let's discuss that next of the high carb intake. So again, the looking back, you're studying people who are eating lots of carbs going forward. If you're one of my patients, you're going to be paying attention to the carbs and keeping them low. And these studies really don't apply. Don't worry about this one. Four, you can choose to do one of two things. Ignore all the data here and dismiss it as just not applicable to a true low carbohydrate diet apart from possibly a ketogenic diet. I don't think that's reasonable. My guess, and it's just that, an educated guess, is that these trends would scale even at lower carbohydrate diets, more in line with what people think of as low carb. Or two, accept the trends in the data. Basically, if you go low carb, some animal-based food is fine. The best analyses that I went over indicated around 12% of calories from animal proteins. Yeah, well, that would fly in the face of a carnivore diet, wouldn't it? You know, he's making some assumptions here, clearly acknowledges those. And I don't think we really can learn a lot from this kind of analysis of these studies of people eating lots of carbs. It would be like taking the driving on the right hand side of the road, all of the things you do, and then applying it to driving on the left hand side of the road in a different country. It, it's just, it's different. It doesn't apply. That's 60 grams on a 2000 calorie diet. That number will increase if your metabolism is higher. And beyond that, de-emphasizing saturated fats while emphasizing unsaturated fats, as well as making sure to fit plant-based foods in the mix. So here's a list of the foods that would be plant-based, but high in unsaturated fats. And a final point on food choices to slant your lower carbohydrate diet to be in line with reduced mortality, making sure that you consume higher quality carbohydrates with the little bit of carbohydrate allotment that you have. If any, things like these, especially fiber rich sources where possible. And five, finally just know that there's a lot to still collect data on and refine. So this isn't the end all be all analysis, but it's the conservative conclusions that we can make based on the current literature. Well, in my book, End Your Carb Confusion, there are three different levels of carbohydrate, and it's not entirely a keto kind of book. 
keto level is one, phase one. Then there are two, phase two and phase three levels. And I agree that you want to eat healthy sources of carbohydrates if you do eat carbohydrates. I don't know that this is going to be applicable if you're doing a keto kind of diet. So the idea of eating carbs to me is okay if your body tolerates it and you're happy with that and all the parameters look good. But to apply, well, you know, if we're driving on the right, driving on the right hand side, you know, if we're driving on the right hand side of the road, you get in the car on the left hand side. And oh, you know, if you're driving on the left hand side of the road, you get on the car on the right hand side. So I don't know if all of these things apply without data going forward and experimental data. We won't know for sure, but is it common sense? Is it face validity? Meaning it, it kind of makes sense. Sure. So I like the video in general, the criticisms of these nutritional epidemiology studies are that they are not experimental studies. So you have confounding and you're assuming that if someone who is healthy eats this way, having someone who's unhealthy eat that way will make them healthy, which ignores the genetic differences among people. And then the idea that you only measure periodically what people are eating, thinking that they're going to eat the same things, is reduced accuracy and precision of the outcomes. When I talk to nutritional epidemiologists about this and the correlation with, say, red meat and cancer, things like that, the correlations are not high. They're, they're very low. And when I say, well, they're too low to make a policy decision from it, they criticize the you know, doctors like me who have such a high criteria and high standard before saying it's a policy and I need to, to have that level before I use it in my clinic. That's just the way doctors are taught. And the kind of comparison is when we would use a drug, it goes through certain different criteria levels and studies and gets approval. And so that's my standard of wanting experimental evidence for what I do and give for advice in my clinic to my patients. It's different than what PhD researchers might say and, and do research on, but a good, good critique. If you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and look for new content on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, consider joining our YouTube membership for early access and exclusive live Q and A's with me. Just click the join button below or support us with a PayPal in the description.